my name is Dave Brennellini. I'm one of the new pastors on staff. Uh, my title is Pastor of Ministries, which means that I work alongside Brad, fellow, our vision, our plan, our philosophy. And then I oversee staff as we try to implement that plan uh, throughout the church. I've been married for 28 years uh, to my wife, Karen. We have two children, uh, Christy, who lives in northern Kentucky and is married to Michael, and Amber, who lives a little bit south of Houston, uh, and she's a special ed teacher. Uh, we are glad to be here. We're excited. Uh, it's been a good, good adjustment, and we feel like people really have kind of taken to us, and we're, we're thankful for that. Uh, the final thing, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, the final thing you need to know about me is that I am a Yankee. Bible Church and its affiliates accept no liability for the Yankee content of the sermon. It is acknowledged that David Brandolini is qualified to make biblical remarks. However, this entity will neither condone nor promote the manner in which the words are spoken. Further, it is the responsibility of you, the listener, to translate all sports illustrations in reference to filthy northern teams into the appropriate and blessed teams of God's country, also known as Texas. If you are pregnant, may become pregnant, or thinking about becoming pregnant, and are unwilling to expose your innocent unborn Texan baby to Yankee, please leave now. Well, only saw one pregnant woman leave, so that's good. Uh, three in the first, two in the second, and one here, so we're uh, making progress. Uh, our staff also was kind of concerned that you would struggle with some of the way I say certain words, and so they encouraged me to kind of help you out. So we created a translation guide uh, for you on translating Yankee talk into Taxi talk. Use guys. Use you guys. guys. Oh, jeez. Like, yeah. you guys? You guys? Wow. <laughs> Yo, Wooder. Wooder? <laughs> I think he meant to say water. Radiator. Could you use that in a sentence, baby? Of course. You put water in the radiator of my car. Oh, radiator. Dog. Like the animal? Like walk your dog. Dog. Like the dog that jumps in the back of my truck. Daughter. <laughs> oh, like my daughter goes to UT. Daughter. Talking. <laughs> oh, 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 I do that all the time. Talking, honey. Eagles. Cowboys. Cowboys. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy my sermon. You all. No, that's not it. Try again. Y'all. No. Y'all. Y'all. Try it. You, you, y'all. You don't have to yell it. Just say it. Y'all. Y'all. No, try it again. Yeah. It's painful. <laughs> painful for me to see myself in a Yankee uh, uniform because I, I hate the Yankees, basically. But uh, I'm fixing to preach, y'all. <laughs> How's that? All right, we've been in the midst of a series uh, in the book of Exodus, going through the life of Moses, looking at his life, learning from it, seeing how God worked in his life and how he can work in ours as well. Uh, maybe you've been here for all those messages. Maybe you've caught some. So let me give you a kind of a quick recap. Uh, Jacob took his family of 66 people that was the Israelite nation at that time and moved to Egypt because there was a famine in the land. And they lived there and they settled there. Uh, but as time went by, Jacob and his sons died. And the nation began to grow larger. And Pharaoh began to be concerned because the nation was getting larger and stronger. So he began to persecute. And he placed the Jewish people into slavery. And they began to build uh, many of the famous things that we see in, in Egypt even today. Uh, but as time goes by, uh, they begin to cry out and say, God, would you please deliver us uh, from this torture that we're in? God hears her cry. And then Moses is born. Uh, Moses is born. His mom uh, tries to hide him because Pharaoh had said, when you see a young Jewish male boy, you're to kill him. Either suffocate him or to throw him into the Nile. Uh, she can't hide him any longer, so she places him in a basket, puts him in the Nile, and entrusts him to God's hands. Uh, the daughter of Pharaoh comes along, hears the baby crying, uh, takes Moses, and raises him as her own. Uh, after about 40 years, Moses is, is unsettled, and he's struggling with being an Egyptian, but yet being an Israelite, and he goes out to see his people, and he thinks, maybe I can be the one to deliver them, and he goes out one day, and he sees an Egyptian taskmaster who's beating uh, one of the Jewish slaves, so he kills that taskmaster, 
Then he hides them in the sand and tries to cover up. Goes home, comes back the next day to see his people again. He sees two Hebrews who are arguing, and he says, Brothers, why are you arguing? And they said to him, Who made you ruler and master over us? Are you going to kill us like you did the taskmaster? So Moses realizes a couple of things. He realizes that uh, they don't want him to be the one to deliver them at this point, and that his crime has been found out. He knows that he can't go back to, uh, to Pharaoh, so he heads out into the wilderness where he lives for 40 years. Uh, he marries, has children, becomes a shepherd, uh, really lives in, 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 anom in, in, he lives an anonymous life out there. Uh, well, one day he goes out, he's uh, taking care of the sheep, and he sees a burning bush. And the bush begins to, sp begins to speak to him. And God speaks through the bush and says, Moses, I want you to go and I want you to deliver the people of Israel from the bondage and their slavery in Egypt. Well, Moses is very reluctant to do that. He doesn't want anything to do with that. Uh, but God speaks to him and says, uh, I will send Aaron along with you. Aaron will be a help to you. Aaron was his brother. And he says, my presence and my power will go with you as well. And he said, this staff that I'm going to give you is going to represent that. So Moses takes the staff. Reluctantly, he heads towards Egypt. He goes to, to see Pharaoh. And he says, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And that catches up to where we're at today. Next week, uh, Brad's going to tackle the ten plagues of Egypt. But for this week, we're going to take a little detour into a New Testament book. We're going to take a detour into the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you don't have your Bible with you, grab one of the red ones in front of you, and I'll tell you what page it's on, so it'll be real easy to find. It's on page 175, which is about three-quarters of the way through your Bible. This Bible, they begin in the Old Testament with page 1, and then in the New Testament, they start again with page 1. So it's about three-quarters of the way through page 175. The Old Testament points us toward the fact that a Messiah is coming. The New Testament reveals that a Messiah has come, and that's Jesus Christ. When I preach, uh, lately I've had a habit of sending the verses to people and saying, what would you want to know from this passage? If you were in the audience, what would you, questions would you have? What would you be interested in? And I did this with this as well. And I want, as I read it, I want you to think about that. What would you want to know? What questions would you have? And what would be of interest to you? So let's read. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. So what questions do you have as you look at it? Well, I sent that passage to my two daughters and my friend Bob from Ohio. Uh, Amber asked this, how did he deal with fear of the unknown and trusting God? Christy said, how do we know that God, what God wants us to do next? And how can we have this kind of faith daily? And my friend Bob said, God spoke directly to Moses on more than one occasion. Isn't it much more difficult for us to do God's will when we have not had that same kind of experience? I think those are good questions. What I like about the questions is they're looking at the Bible and they're saying, how does this apply to me? How can I live this out? The Bible isn't just a book we look back on and say, well, that's interesting. It's a book we're supposed to look at to learn from and say, well, how does this apply to me? How does this impact our lives today? Chapter 11 is called the faith chapter. It's a chapter that talks about people from the Old Testament and how they lived by faith. If you let your eyes kind of glance down in chapter 11, if you look at the paragraph starts, you'll see a phrase that's repeated over and over again. It's the phrase, by faith. So it says, by faith we understand the world came to be. By faith Abel offered a sacrifice. By faith Noah built his ark. By faith Abraham moved to a country and a land that God promised him that he would have. And God promised him that his, his descendants will be as numerous as the sand on the sea and the stars in the sky, even though he was old and didn't even have an heir. And so they lived by faith. They obeyed God and they followed through on the things that he said, the things that they believed to be true because God promised them. Look at verse 1. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does faith mean? God tells us. Look at verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That phrase, not seen, is really important. It was the last 
phrase that I read in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. It says, Moses was looking to the things that were unseen. Things unseen. When you talk about things unseen, you don't use words like assurance and conviction. You use words like maybe and perhaps. But here it talks about things that are unseen, and it's, it uses the word assurance and conviction. Because the things that are unseen are promises from God. So our, the reason we can have assurance and conviction is because we believe in who God is. We believe that God is sovereign, that God is in control. And if he gives a promise, if he gives his word, that we can trust in that even if we don't see it. Look at verse 13. All these died in faith. All the people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 died before they saw the fulfillment of all these things. Abraham never saw his descendants. Abraham never saw the country that he was going to go to and the land that he was going to go to. So when we live by faith, we're living by the promises of God. We're trusting in who God is. We're trusting in what he said. And chapter 11 unfolds that for us. So all the people that they mention there are people that lived by faith. And Moses is found in the chapter that talks about living by faith. Living by faith is living our life in obedience to God's word, to the promises of God. I want to give you a principle. It's a principle that comes from Colossians. It's a principle that will help us understand how Moses lived the way that he did. It will help us understand some of the questions uh, that we might have had and the questions that uh, my two daughters and Bob also put before us. It's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. If you have the Red Bible, it's page 158, so you'll get there probably before everybody else if you want to look along with us. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ... Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your, mar set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. When I, when I read that, those verses, I thought of a book. I'm not sure why I thought of the book. It was kind of a strange book to think of. The book I thought of was Eat This, Not That. The idea behind this book is if you're looking to count calories, if you're looking to look, lose some weight, this guy wrote a book, a guide, that would help you as you go to certain restaurants, as you're cooking at home. Cook this, don't cook that. Some of the things are really rather obvious. For instance, if you go to McDonald's, you might want to order the hamburger as opposed to the quadruple, triple cheeseburger. It's kind of obvious. Other things aren't quite as obvious, and this book kind of guides you through that, and it helps you to know what to eat. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to flip it around, and I want to build our principle for today. The principle is that, not this. That, not this. So I'm kind of twisting it around, changing it, dropping the word eat from it. That, not this. Paul wrote these verses to people who were trying to live out their life, to live out their newfound faith in this world. In, in Colossians 3 again, look at verse 1 again. It starts off with a really important phrase. It says this, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ. Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ. Paul's going to tell us something and then he's going to say, this is the important basis for what I'm going to tell you next. Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ. What Paul is saying there, therefore, if you've experienced salvation. Therefore, if you've experienced the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then these other things are true. So it's a very important phrase for us to get right. There's a verse that I love from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, Jesus never sinned. So God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, Jesus again, we might become the righteousness of God. Somebody attached a, a title to that, and they called it the great exchange. The reason they called that is because what happens in this verse is that God the Father takes our sin, all the things that we've done wrong, all the ways that we fall short of what God would want us to be. And he's taken that sin and he placed it upon Jesus Christ on the cross. And then in exchange, he gives to us life, eternal life, and righteousness. That's why it's called the great exchange. Jesus lived the life we should have lived, but we can't. And he died the death that we should have died, the death that we deserved. He was beaten, he was bruised, and he was crucified. That's why it's called an exchange. Christ lived the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, and then he offers something in exchange. And what he offers to us is salvation and new life in Christ. So when Paul says, therefore, if 
if um, you've been risen with Christ, that's what he means. If you've experienced that exchange, if there's been a time in your life where you've said, I need a Savior, and you've turned to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, will you be my Savior? That's what Paul means here. He says, if that is true, then, what does he tell us? He says, seek the things above, set your heart and your mind on the things above. Another way to say that is seek that, not this. So we could restate Colossians 3 by saying, since you know Jesus, seek that, the things that are above, not this, the things that are of the world. There's the title of the message. That, not this. Okay, you understand the principle? So he says, seek after that, not this. Uh, I find that really difficult to do. What is that? That is Jesus. That is Jesus. When we think about eternity, heaven, we can think about those things, but really the main thing of that is Jesus Christ himself. So we're to seek that, we're to set our mind on that. When we talk about this, what we mean is this world. The things that we interact with, the things that call our attention day by day. The things that we do, the activities that we take part of. The things that we're running our kids to. Uh, you'll notice from these graphics, they're not evil and bad things, are they? They're just this world. The stuff that we get wrapped up in. What Paul says here is don't let your, your love your heart, your passion, your desires, your vision, your goal, your finances, who you are, be wrapped up in this. Set your heart, your mind, your vision, your goals, your passion on that. How do we do that? I find that extremely, extremely difficult to do. Because this is so tangible, isn't it? This screams out at me every day. I have to do this when I wake up. I have to go through this when I go to work. And you experience that as well. These are the things that yell to us really, really loud. And even though there's this desire in us to not get wrapped up in this and to focus on that, we find ourselves getting pulled into this all the time. That's our experience. It's my experience. And I think it's probably true for you as well. This is so tangible. This is what you see. The that is like it says in Hebrews 11. It's unseen. And so since it's unseen, we have a tendency to lose track of it. Well, how did Moses apply the that, not this principle? We're going to go back to Hebrews 11. We're going to go back to the verses that we're unpacking, and we're going to find out a little bit about it. It's Hebrews 11 again, verse 24 through 27. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Here's what this means. Rose, <laughs> roses. <laughs> Moses refused this. That's what that verse means. Moses came to the point in his life where he says, I am willing to walk away from this. What did this mean for Moses? This for Moses was everything. He was raised in the palace of the king. Moses had all the right education. Moses had money. Moses had military training. Moses could have any woman he wanted in Egypt. In our day, we say he had the job, the car, the girl, the perfect kids, all that stuff. That's what we'd say today of Moses. He had everything. So when he was willing to refuse this and give it up, he was giving up the palace. That was the price he was going to pay. But Moses had come to a point in his life where he said, this no longer is my identity. There was a time in Moses' life where as he walked along, someone might say, who's that? And they'd say, oh, that's, that's Moses. He's the, the daughter of, sorry, he's the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That was his identity. Moses was really somebody. Moses was powerful. Moses was the person that we set out to be, whatever goals you have. He had accomplished those things. But here it says that Moses refuses to be known any longer in his life as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He changes his allegiance. He changes his identity. So what he says is my identity now will be my identity is that I'm a child of God and I'm identifying myself with the people of God. And that's a choice that he made. And he was willing to do that. He was willing to make that sacrifice ask you a question. Who are you? Who are you? Who am I? When people ask me questions. Now, I know it would be kind of strange to go to a business meeting and introduce yourself and say, hi, I'm Bill. I'm a child of God. That's a little strange. I get that. But how long would it take before people understood where our allegiance is? Would they have any clue that our heart and our mind and our soul and our passions is attached to that rather than this? 
Do they see it in the way that we conduct business? Do they see it in the way that we raise our children? Do they see it in the way that we, we pursue sports and vacation and leisure? In other words, as we go day by day living in the this, do people notice there's any difference with that? Would our friends, our family notice that there's something different about the way he approaches life? Different standard. What would our kids think about us, for those of you that have kids? As you look at the things that they're involved in, their education, their activities, their sports, whatever it might be, do they know that for you, your value, your identity is not found in what they accomplish? Or, did, or would they look at the way you raise them and say, my parents seem to think this is all there is. This 70, 75, 80 years is what it's all about. And let's pour all of our vision, our passion, our heart, our mind into this. Because that is not really important. This is what's seen. That is what is invisible. What would they say about us? What would people recognize in us? If we know Christ, our desire is that it wouldn't be that way. Our desire is that people would know that we look forward to the that. And we align ourselves with that and not with this. But it's a struggle, isn't it? Identity. Where's our identity? Moses refused this in verse 24. Let's look at verses 25, verse 25. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses refused this, and then Moses received suffering. Moses didn't deny this and then received all this incredible blessing in his life. And people said, oh, that was a great decision. Sometimes when we refuse this and we don't align ourselves with this, it means that we experience suffering. And that's what happened to Moses. He experienced mistreatment. He experienced disgrace. He went from having two people, the Egyptians and the Israelites, to having no people. Because he refused the Egyptians, and the Israelites refused him, and he had no people. And then he had to flee and go into the desert. And he says, disgrace for Jesus is better than all the treasures that I experienced in Egypt. How can someone make that kind of decision? How can someone go from a mansion to living in slums? From the king's palace to identifying with slaves. How can someone make that kind of decision? You're not going to make that decision because it makes sense. And you're not going to make that decision because people go, yeah, it's a great decision. Why don't you do that? You're going to make that decision because your value is in that and not this. So Moses refused this. Moses experienced suffering. There was a missionary named Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim Elliott decided that he was going to go into the jungles. And he was going to go to a group of people that had never heard about Jesus before. And people said, you're crazy. Well, Jim Elliot went, and the reality is he went there and they killed him and some of his friends. So in refusing this for Jim Elliot, he received death. But he knew that the greatest value was that, the unseen part, the promises of God. And here's, he's famous for a statement. Here's the statement. It's really good. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let me read that one more time. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus talked about that, not this kind of living. And he said some things that are interesting. He said this, if you want to live, you need to die. If you want to receive, you need to give. If you want to gain, you need to lose. And if you want to be first, you need to be last. You're not going to hear that in any uh, seminar. But Jesus said if you're going to have that kind of thinking, not this kind of thinking, you have to think differently about this world. And if you have that kind of thinking, it doesn't mean it's going to happen now for you. It might not happen now for you. But it will happen then if we have that kind of thinking. People who choose this kind of thinking have kind of upside down thinking. They're willing to be right side up with God, even if it means being upside down with the way this world is. So Moses refused this. Moses experienced suffering because Moses valued that. And that's verse 26 and 27. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to that reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is seen. Moses valued that. Uh, let me answer two questions about this, this, the verses I just read, because they might have been one of the questions that you had. In fact, it was one of the questions that my friend Bob had. Where it says, considering the reproach of Christ's greater riches, the question was for my friend, I don't remember Christ being mentioned in the story of Moses. 
Good observation, good question. Because it wasn't. Here's two possible answers. When God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, that might have been Christ speaking. Christ is eternal. Christ is God. Uh, the, the triune God is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So that could have been Moses experiencing Christ at that point. Uh, the other explanation, which I think I lean to a little bit more, the book of Hebrews is written, is a New Testament book written after Christ. What the writer of, New, of the book of Hebrews understood was the story of, God's, of, the story of God and God's history. <clears throat> Excuse me. The story begins with God creating the world and creating man. Man turns and rebels against God and turns his back to him and sins against God. And then what happens is God reaches out to him and promises that one day a Messiah will come. One day a Savior will come. And God continues to love and to reach out to people. And they either respond to that or they turn their back on him. So as, the peop as time goes by and we read about the people in Hebrews 11 who had faith, the faith that they were exercising was a faith in a future Messiah. So now the writer of Hebrews looks back and he knows that the story is carrying on. It's fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So he's able to write and to say as they exercise faith and as Moses was experiencing re reproach and mistreatment, it actually was for the sake of Christ. For the future sake of Christ for Moses. But now looking back historically, it was for Christ. The other question you might have had was if you read verse 27, it says, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. And you might say, well, I remember when Brad spoke about that. It seemed as though Moses killed the Egyptian. They find out about it. He's fearful, and he runs away. This verse, verse could also be translated, by faith he left G Egypt, not because he feared the wrath of the king. Not because he feared the wrath of the king. He left for another reason. What would that other reason be? The other reason would be, if it was the first time he left Egypt, it would be because he refused the people of Egypt. He turned his back on that. The people of Israel rejected him. He had nowhere else to go, so he went to the desert. So in other words, he went to the desert, and it wasn't because he feared the king. He went to the desert by faith, because I had nowhere else to go, so by faith I'm, I'm heading to the desert. The other explanation would be that it might refer to the time when he left with all the people of Israel. So Moses had come back to Egypt. He had told, let my people go. Eventually Pharaoh let them go. And now they're leaving, and at this point, he's not fearing the wrath of the king. Not sure which one is right, but those are two, I think, pretty good explanations. In verse 25, it says he, uh, sorry, verse 26, it says considering. It uses that word. That word could also be used as assessing. So the reason that Moses could experience reproach and mistreatment is because he assessed. What, had, what did he assess? He assessed true value. Uh, in our home, not really, but it's an illustration. In our home, we have a bowl that we proudly display over our mantle. We don't have a mantle, so that's why it's an illustration. Uh, the reason we put this over our mantle is because this is of amazing value, this particular bowl. This bowl our dog eats out of because this bowl really has no value. Uh, Karen and, and I enjoy watching a show called Antiques Roadshow. The idea between Antiques Roadshow, if you've never seen it, is people take things that they think are valuable to a location, let's say the Austin Civic Center, and they go before these experts who assess and place a value on items. And so I'm taking these two items and I say, you know, I got two items that I, that I think one's valuable and I don't think one's very valuable. In fact, I feed my dog from this one. And the guy's eyes get big and he grabs it and he looks at it and he says, you know, from the markings on the back of this item, you know, the bowl that you feed your dog from, I'm learning some amazing things. This is a national treasure. I can tell by these markings that this bowl was present at the First Continental Congress when they were signing the Declaration of Independence. In fact, this marking, by this marking, I can match it up and tell you for sure that a, uh, Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> that Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and John Hancock ate M&Ms out of this bowl. <laughs> this is priceless, and you've been feeding your dog out of it. And then he would grab this one and say, on the other hand, the bowl that you felt was priceless, I can tell by the markings here, it was made in China and bought in Walmart. Bought in Walmart. What happened? I, I mixed up the values, didn't I? I had it confused. The thing that I thought was really valuable wasn't valuable. The thing that I thought, I'm getting it backwards. The thing that I thought was not valuable was actually very, very priceless. And I was feeding my dog out of it. 
what Moses had done is he came to a point in his life where he realized what was of real value. And all the treasures and the prestige and the identity and the name that he found in Egypt was nothing. It was 70, 75 years at best. And it wasn't what really was valuable because it was all going to fade away. What really was valuable was the unseen thing, the that in our illustration. And Moses says, I'm willing to pursue that. I'm willing to experience, I'm willing to walk away, I'm willing to experience mistreatment and disgrace and reproach because I have learned what is really of value. And the point is that this is not what is of value. This is fleeting and this will pass away. What is of real value is Jesus Christ, eternity, and living with Him. So I mixed it up, didn't I? I had everything crossed up. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't that what we do every day? When we pour our heart, our mind, our soul, our passions, our money, our goals, our vision into this. Instead of pouring those things into that. In other words, we're mixing things up. And we're eating out of the dog food when there's so much more for us. Moses would realize what was real value in this life. And it was Jesus. Let me give you an amazing statement. If you can understand this statement, you'll understand the whole Bible in one statement. And it goes like this. Because Jesus valued us, because Jesus valued us, here's the statement. Jesus left that. And he came to this, to be born as a baby, to experience what we experienced, so that we might have that one day. That that, he made that possible. So Jesus left that, came to this, so that you and I could experience that one day. Because he valued us so much. Because he loved us so much. He was willing to do that. He was willing to come and experience the persecution, being crucified, nailed to a tree, to die. Because he values us. So he left that, came to this, so that we could have that. That's the whole Bible summarized in a phrase. It's good to know. There's a story in the New Testament. It's in Matthew 19. That to me is the saddest story in the Bible. And I'm going to recap it real quickly for you. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said to him, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and said, all right, I'll work with your train of thinking. You see, because we believe there's nothing you can do to gain eternal life. That's why Jesus died on the cross. It's been done for us. But Jesus is working with him and said, all right, let me, let me work with your thinking. What about the commandments? And he says, oh, perfect. I've kept all the commandments since I was a little boy. Check. Got that one done. And Jesus turns him. And the Bible says that Jesus loved him. Jesus valued him. And Jesus said, there's one thing you're lacking. He says, go and sell everything you own. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me so you can have eternal life. What Jesus was really communicating to him is that it's not what you do. It's me. But he knew that this guy was hung up. And it, here's the sad part of the story. It says that the person turned his back on Christ and walked away because he had a lot of stuff. This young person had really mixed things up. He thought the dog bowl was valuable. Sorry, he thought the dog bowl was not valuable and the other thing was really valuable. He had it all mixed up. And that's why it's such a sad story to me. Is, is that true of us? Have we mixed up the things that are really valuable in this life? And the only thing that is of true, lasting value is Christ. It's the only thing for eternity. Everything else will fade away, will pass away. Well, you might have a question like my daughter had. Well, how do we do this today? How do I live in such a way that I'm not focused on this, I'm focused on that? Well, the Bible tells us if we read a little farther in Hebrews, it's in chapter 12, the next chapter for us. Verse 1 and 2, it says this. Therefore, since we have... Such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. What that means is back in chapter 11, since there were so many people that we can look to and live by faith, we have this great cloud of witnesses. He says, um, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Is Jesus going to ask you to give up everything like he did the rich young ruler? Probably not. That's probably not what he's going to ask for you. He's probably going to ask you to give up something. And what it says in this verse here is, is whatever that is, whatever has got you entangled in the this, put it aside and fix your eyes on Jesus. 
Uh, it was amazing to me that how many songs we had today that talked about fixing your eyes on Jesus, and then Don talked about Peter fixing his eyes on Jesus. We didn't talk about that beforehand, but God has an amazing way of communicating things to us. So how do we live this way? We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. What do I mean? As you go through your daily day, moment by moment, day by day, you need to consciously remind yourself to fix your eyes on the that, the unseen, the Jesus, and not on this. So as you're heading out to work, say, Lord, help me to put my eyes upon you today. Help me to do things in a way that would reflect that my values aren't in this. As I spend my money, Lord, help me to do that. As I raise my kids, as we go on vacation, as we buy a car, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's all the this. Remember that this isn't all that bad. As we're engaging in my kids' activities, help me to communicate to my kids that this isn't all there is. That there's something more beyond that. And the only way I can do that is if I'm consistently fixing my eyes on Jesus. Because when I don't do that, all I do is look at this and I get confused. I get my values mixed up. And I forget about the that and I focus on the this. So how can you do it? You need to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. I, I don't have a three-step formula for you. But if you look at Jesus, if you ask him, if you try to live by faith, believing that his promises are true, he will help you day by day to not get your values mixed up and not find your identity in this world. Um, I'd like to close uh, the service a little different this morning. I just want to give you some time with God. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your head in a minute. And it's just between you and God. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. We don't often take time out and assess and to think, Lord, are my values mixed up? Am I pouring my life into this instead of that? So I'm just going to give you some time to talk to God. It's just between you and him. And if, and if you've never uh, asked him to be your savior, this is a time where you can assess that as well. And say, Lord, I, I, I need you. I, I want that great exchange. I want to give you my sin in exchange. Receive your righteousness. So whatever it is that God's speaking to your heart, I just want to give you a few moments today as we close to do that. So go ahead and close your eyes and, and just talk to God. And tell him to reveal to you if you've got your values misplaced and what they are. And to ask for his help to fix your eyes upon him. Could you stand for a final prayer? This is something that applies to all of us. There's nobody that has this down. <laughs> we all struggle with this day by day. Uh, let's pray and ask God for his help. Father, we can identify with this. It's so easy for us to get pulled into this, to lose track of what's valuable. It screams out to us. It, it demands our attention. Uh, Lord, we want to be different. We want to have a perspective that our eyes are on the unseen and that our heart and our mind is, is set on that, not on this. So help us day by day, moment by moment, to fix our eyes on Christ, to seek his help so that we can live in a way that shows that we believe in you, uh, that you've changed us, and that our value isn't here on earth. Uh, thanks for helping us. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, thanks for listening this morning. We'll see you next week. Take care.